Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Nicole Armstrong. She is founder and CEO at Queen City Certified. And I'll let Nicole speak to what Queen City is all about and to your innovation background as well, especially in the social enterprise sector. Nicole, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So uh, Queen City Certified is the first employer certification for gender equity in the U.S. workplace. And my background to get here is a little bit um, maybe non-traditional. So I actually started off in design, and I think that that ability to problem solve has followed me throughout my career, but um, worked in the social sector for over a decade. So always been passionate about social justice and equity and had most recently been using those skills in the social innovation space. It's fascinating to me. You're not just your background as a graphic designer, maybe in your core roots back in the day, but I think it, it seems to me like your career transformed into design thinking expertise. Um, and that then led you to create your own startup. And what I would argue is not just a startup, it's a movement around gender equity. Um, so could you share with us a little bit more about that transformation from design thinking into uh, the, the guts to, to start a movement? <laughs> Absolutely. So, it, you know, I always view it as a culmination of life experiences, both of my own and of, of people that I've known. And having worked in the social innovation space, I had the opportunity to work with a, large, a lot of uh, marginalized communities. And there's one story in particular that always um, sort of resonated with me. And it was a woman that I had worked with who um, had been a researcher with us on one of our projects when we were looking at health outcomes for kids under five. And she was a single mom, and she was expecting her second child and went into labor very early. Uh, before 30 weeks, actually. And her That's son so was very, very scary. And her son was in the NICU, and um, she had no access to paid time off. Mm. She had no access to paid parental leave. And because her company was less than 50 people, she didn't even have access to unpaid leave. Right. And so it always sat so with me. So her job itself was at risk. Exactly. Yeah, just simply for having a child. And um, so I always remembered thinking, you know, we talk about how much we value family in this country, and we hear that a lot, but it sort of raised the question, but which families do we value? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, after my experience working as a social innovation specialist, I was actually uh, undergoing my own job search and uh, had received this offer from a great company, very large company here in town. And they sent over in the Cincinnati, benefits package where we're in Cincinnati, yeah. where we're headquartered. And the benefits didn't mention anything about parental leave. Um, you know, I, I was a mom of one, and I wasn't planning on having kids right away, another child right away. But I wanted to know, like, would that be, in my, if that were in sure. my future, would, would the, be, the opportunity be there? And it was sort of this uncomfortable position to be in, because do you ask? Like, do you right. ask about it and then have, have the employer maybe assume that you're thinking of having kids right away? Um, and so I remember thinking it should just be transparent, right? There needs to be a level of transparency. And I received the offer, which was great. I was really excited about the role. But the role wasn't quite in line with what the title and the salary they were offering. And the, I remember the salary was just above what I'd made at a very small nonprofit. Hey. And and when I sort of brought that up and said, hey, there seems like there's a misalignment, um, the recruiter totally agreed with me. So I did what any uh, person would do, you know, in the, in the era of leaning in. And I negotiated and the offer was rescinded. And I remember thinking in the back of my mind, had I been a man, would this wow. have happened in the same way? Would the outcome have been the same? So fast forward maybe month, month and a half, and I ran into a good friend of mine who I had gone to college with. And she said, you know, I was working for a firm for over a year as a freelancer. And they told me they were going to make this job permanent. And I said, well, I'd love for you to consider me. And at the time, she was expecting. And her boss looked at her and literally said, well, look at you. We can't hire you. And so it was, it was one of those moments where I just... I, unbelievable. First, I was so yeah, it was unbelievable, and I thought, why are we still talking about this in 2018? Yeah, absolutely. This is absurd. Yeah. And at the time, my daughter was a little over a year, almost a year and a half, and and I just thought, I don't want her to be having these conversations or to doubt um, how far she can go or what she can achieve based on her gender. And so that's where this idea for a certification around gender equity was born. I sort of thought, you know, if we looked at this from an asset based approach. 
how can we celebrate what organizations are doing well, <laughs> make it more visible, right? That's that accountability and that transparency piece, and then encourage them to raise the bar for everybody else in their industry. So that's that's where this was born. It was just life experiences, I suppose. Incredible. So it was, you know, a culmination of social observation. Um, and so much of that was thanks to the position you were in as an innovation specialist in a social enterprise organization. And then combined with personal experience, I think even as you're sharing those stories, I personally, and I'm sure listeners, can think of 10 other people in your life or a personal memory you have of feeling nervous about how to advocate for your family needs or your personal needs, your health needs. Um, and some of those uh, issues are just more, uh, even even more heightened for women when we are the ones to deliver children, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of my own stories. I know uh, as a graduate student, if, if a graduate student got pregnant in the universities where I, I was a student, there were no policies to protect us as, as laborers at the university. Uh, we were teachers, you know, we were uh, instructors, if you will, and there were no policies to, to protect graduate students at some of the universities I worked in. Um, or I'm thinking of even getting paternity leave mm -hmm. negotiated. Um, I had a good friend who worked in a manufacturing company and when he went to request paternity leave, the answer he got from HR was, well, we've never done that for anyone in the past, so we really can't start a new precedent. That would be unfair to the past. <laughs> and I, it was just so, you know, these stories, so they sound almost like they're from an alien planet that we're still having these debates. So tell us, tell me more about, you know, I think that just speaks to the power of pulling those stories together in order to identify why uh, something innovative must happen. Absolutely. Um, you know, so when I sort of had this idea, I started doing research. I really wanted to understand what was out there, what existed. And, um, you know, I found a certification, a global certification around gender equity. But I thought, you know, the, the culture of the United States and how we approach um, sort of workplace and opportunity is very different. It's very different based on culture, even between the United States and a country like Canada, which you would think culturally isn't that different. But when we look at benefits, for instance, there it's we don't have any protected paid family leave um, in the United States, whereas I have friends and colleagues in Canada who have, you know, up to 18 months um, of, of paid leave and protection for their job. And so I really wanted to design something around the United States. But I think what's so interesting about your observation um, this idea of how do you collect stories and how do they they impact individuals. And I think that is where um, part of our work lies. Mm -hmm. You know, part of what we even talk about is how um, our systems have been designed with sort of the male experience as the center. It's sort of considered universal, right? And the female experience, or um, I would even argue people of color, their, their experience is considered niche. And so even how we've designed our workplaces, how we've designed our systems is reflective of that. And I use the example, I, I don't know if you've seen this film yet, but Little Women, um, you know, I, I took my mom for her birthday. It was a fabulous film. We went in and I think all but two people in the audience were women. <laughs> and so it sort of gets this this notion that this film is it's a niche. woman's film, yeah, right? It's a right, niche right, film. Right. And then you look alternatively at a film like Dead Poet Society, where it's it's all about male students and a male teacher, right. but nobody sees that as a male-only movie, sure, right? Sure. And so part of what we talk about and part of the storytelling that we do is we start to look at systems through the frame of who are we actually designing them for and how do we define a human experience? And when we really dive a little bit deeper, we start to see that it's through the through usually a white male lens. Um, but it affects men, too. And, and that's what I think is so important. When you're talking about paternity leave, um, you know, even within our own certification, we don't reward organizations for maternity leave because it reinforces the notion that it's a woman's job to take care of children. Interesting. Right? But really, yeah. it's everyone's job and opportunity to take care of children. And there are many men out there who would like to be more active in their children's lives. Mm -hmm. And there was a study that Deloitte did that found that even when men have access to pay time off, they don't take it. At the most, they take because about 10 days. Because culturally, often exactly. it's not accepted. So so if you, even if you can get it passed through human resources, you may come back to your particular uh, coworkers and and say your plans, and their response. Even and this is true for women too. 
um, you know, expecting mothers, their response might be, oh, well, I only took two days off. Or, right. I know. actually had a, a gentleman come up to me and say, look, we had a young father who was going to take the entire parental leave. And one of the partners in the firm said, well, you're not going to take the whole leave. I thought you wanted to make partner. Oh, you wow. know, so there's this yeah. there's this expectation that even when it's available to you, somehow, um, you know, you shouldn't take the full amount of time. And um, and so we actually only reward points for organizations that offer uh, parental leave for people of all genders. Beautiful. That makes um, a lot of sense. Yeah, because really what it's about sharing that caregiving and giving an opportunity for dads. And one of the best stories we can tell of our impact was from one of our very first cohorts. Uh, one of our certified organizations changed their policy to include men in parental leave. And there was a wow. new dad who was able to take parental leave for the first time and bond with his child shortly after that organization got certified. So in fact, one of the first innovation or impact stories that we heard was about a man benefiting from gender equity. So, Beautiful. That's um, incredible. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think it's part of it is is sort of finding that human connection. And I think everybody can relate in some way to the challenges or obstacles of bal- balancing family life with work life. And so that's a great place to start. Absolutely. You know, I, I know that I've uh, I've uh, asked a lot of questions that kept us uh, focused on parental leave, but I know that's only one element of what certification means. So tell me more about your innovation, how you thought of this concept of a gender equity certification, and what does that actually look like? Yeah, absolutely. So I loved what you said before, that it's a movement, because that's really our ultimate goal. And uh, our Our true mission is to create a movement of employers and of people who are committed to gender equity in the workplace. And so even when thinking through what this process we look like, um, you know, one of my main focuses was how do we bring people together and how do we leverage what's already being done well? And so we actually built the certification as a cohort model. So the employers who go through certification actually do it with other employers. And it's from a cross sector and a cross size. So we've had anywhere from cultural institutions to government departments to uh, law firms go through it as as a group. And what's amazing about that is the shared experiences, right? It's a lot of organizations are facing similar challenges. And a lot of them have unique stories to share, even in their own experiences of overcoming those challenges or their success stories, what they've tried. And so we bring them together so that they can share those uh, as a cohort. Um, And then the other piece of it, I think, you know, it's one thing to have policies and practices in place, which as a certification program, we do audit those policies and practices. We want to make sure that they're in place. But the other piece of it is really understanding how they're implemented. And so we conduct a survey of uh, our employers' employees to really understand experience across different groups. And so we disaggregate that data by demographic subgroups. So we can really start to um, dive in into sort of the intersectional experience that someone might have. And that's another piece of the story, I think, too, is often when we think about gender equity, we think of women. Um, But we really want to start challenging people to say, really, this is about people of all genders. And how do we create an environment that allows people regardless of race or income or sexual orientation to thrive. Um, And so we look at uh, gender in a much more holistic view. So we have a lot of conversations and storytelling around the intersection of gender and race and gender and class um, so that we can start to uh, bring to light some of those personal stories, but also um, allow our employers to start looking at systems in a different way. And they can start saying, but how would it affect this particular group, right? Because how how um, a policy might affect women, for instance, might be different than men. How it might affect women of color might be different than trans women. So we really want to start challenging them to think through those lenses. So the survey data gives us a lot of those insights. We can really start to understand how do women experience the workplace, for instance, overall compared to women of color? And are there similarities and are there disparities? And all of this data, all of these data points gives our employers an opportunity to focus on maybe where they should put their priorities over the next few years. We really walk with them hand in hand and accompany them in developing sort of a roadmap moving forward. Uh, and they share with each other what their goals are so that they can start to um, sort of build a network of support uh, with one another. And then the final piece of that, I would say, is, um, you know, part of what we try to do is co-design with our employers. So at the end of each cohort, we always have a reflection session where we say, what worked? What do you need? How can we help you in achieving your goals? And one of the most exciting pieces that came out of a cohort in early 2019 was this idea that a lot of our organizations are trying to tackle similar challenges. Absolutely. 
but they're working in silos, right? right? So you have all these different organizations around the city and around the region working on similar challenges, but they're working in silos within their own organizations. And so the challenge was, hey, if we were going to um, support each other in this work, if we were going to help each other with uh, sort of the time and the capacity restraints that we have, what would that look like? And this particular cohort said, well, what if we developed working groups? What if we had, we, we found out what our shared challenges were, we came together as a group, and then we took a deep dive on that challenge, developed approaches, and then shared it out with the other working groups. So we may go deep on one issue, but then at the end of it, we have access to three different approaches based on the other issues that the groups are working on. So we launched that last October. What were some of the topical areas? Yeah, so one of the biggest areas was around recruitment and interviewing practices. So how do we not only um, increase the diversity of candidates that we have coming in the door, but how do we even tackle diversity of sectors, right? So we have organizations who are in the tech industry, the life sciences industry, um, you know, industries that tend to be very, um, I, I would say, lack diversity, very white, and in some instances, very male. How do we help diversify that? How do we make these industries more inclusive for other people who might be interested in them? Uh, and so that particular group is going to do a deep dive on not only how do you reach more diverse candidates, but how do we start to support diversity within the sector itself? So that's a really exciting one. The other one was sort of going back to what we were talking about before around parental leave, but also there's other policies, I think, that organizations put in place that people often feel like maybe they can't take. So how do we create a culture where people feel empowered and able to actually take advantage of the policies that are in place? So we have a group that's committed to culture. And they're going to be doing a deep dive to understand what are some of the barriers that get in the way of people wanting to take the time, whether it's flex time to care for an aging parent or maybe time off for a newborn a child or an adopted child. But how can we begin to shift that culture? And then our final group is around leadership development. So once we get people in the door. We get this incredible talent in the door. How do we keep them? How do we move women and other underrepresented groups through the pipeline from the very entry up to the very top? You know, because oftentimes what we'll see is there's a drop off around mid-management. Sure. So we want to say, how do we make sure we're putting systems in place to get them there? So that's what that working group will be working on. And what's really exciting is they're using the design thinking process. So over the course of a year, they're going to go through discovery and sense making and ideation and prototyping to see what works. And then they're going to be developing tools that then they'll share out with the other working groups at the end of the year. It's incredible. It's really beautiful. I think of uh, so much of the heart of innovation lies in that interdisciplinary and collaborative creation. And you're bringing together leaders and workers from so many different sectors um, who are diverse in terms of their identity and their backgrounds and even the the particular function that they're serving in the companies that they work for. And you're asking them how to uh, sort of percolate together to solve problems that really do cross every sector um, and some more than others, as you mentioned. Uh, what's so neat to me is you've created Queen City Certified is an innovation in and of itself, but to become part of that community, to become certified is, in my opinion, it's an articulation from those companies that they also want to be innovative. They want to, there's a lot of research out there to say that diversity fuels innovation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's what's so inspiring, actually. I, I always um, sort of brag on my clients because I love them so much. And they are, I think, the interesting thing about certification, even when we're talking about storytelling, it's almost a visual symbol to the community and to peers and to other organizations that this organization is committed to doing this work. Yes. And I always say that certification is the beginning of the journey, not the end. And so the organizations coming in, they're not coming in. You know, what's interesting is when we talk to them, certification is sort of the icing on the cake. But really what they're coming in for is the framework and the structure and the tools they need to get to where they're going. It's really that idea of how do we have accompaniment on the way to getting to our goals. Absolutely. And um, and so certification is sort of this visual symbol that they're on this journey. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's accountability. Exactly. It's accountability. It's transparency. It's celebration. Yeah. And it's um, the how. Yes. I, I think so many organizations, um, they're... Uh, the b business culture today, uh, people are much more articulate, much more um, clear about the importance of gender equity and racial equity and inclusivity. 
But I think because of what you mentioned around systemic structures of how business is done um, or how industries run, we it tends the, the how is really the the really most difficult part. And so not only are you providing roadmaps, you're also bringing together leaders and and building off of their unique ideas and strategies. Absolutely. And I think that's how we get there. Um, and so one of sort of one of my main missions is to always be based in research, to always be based in practice so that we can understand what works and what doesn't work and never to become so in love with an idea or an approach if it doesn't work. And so even at the beginning of this process, part of the um, uh, sort of work that I'd done was really doing research to understand how do we actually disrupt bias in organizational systems, right? Because we spend, in the United States, we spend a lot of money on diversity trainings, and there's little research to show that they actually improve diversity. And part of the challenge is that behavior is really difficult to change. So even when we're aware of our own bias, it's very hard to change habits, behaviors, things that we're comfortable with, right? So what are the tweaks that we can make to our systems? What are the little things that we can do, whether in policy or practice, that can actually help disrupt bias? And I always use this example because I think it's um, such a phenomenal example. But th there was a study that Harvard Business Review did where they found that in a final pool of four candidates, if there's only one woman or if there's only one person of color, they statistically have zero chance of getting hired. Wow. And when we think about this, even when we think about EEOC standards and we have sort of these minimum requirement rules of in interviewing at least one woman or person of color, well, we know now that statistically it doesn't, that's not going to have the impact that we're actually hoping it will have, right? So what can we do instead? And what they found was even if you increase that by one, so you have two women or two people of color, in that final pool of four candidates, their chances jump to 50%. It actually becomes representative of the candidate pool. Yeah. And that's an easy tweak, right? Yeah. That's yeah, something exactly. that we can change within our system that quote. can give us better outcomes. You know, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a metric to, right. to try to aim for. And it, it's very practical. Um, yeah, it makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's tied to outcomes. And so exactly. I think that's um, part of part of our goal is to give employers the tools to try these things out, to not get tied to any one approach, but to really understand what works yeah. um, and, and to just be really foundational in, in the approach to gender equity so that we can start to move the needle. Yeah. I want to ask a question about the vulnerability that it takes to get a group of business leaders to open up and share stories about what's not working and how they're failing. Um, you know, I, I just think there's so much vulnerability and fear that people might have around talking about disparities of any kind. Um, and it's tied to what our personal identities are, how much privilege came with that, with our backgrounds. Could you share some stories that you've heard or some moments where you were very proud that vulnerable conversations that needed to be had were spoken because of the nature of what you're drawing attention to through, through Queen City Certified. Yeah. You know, it's interesting <clears throat> you mentioned vulnerability because at the beginning of this process, one of my biggest fears was that no one would sign up to do this. <laughs> sure. You know, it takes it People takes will be a too lot. afraid. People to... will be too afraid. And I think, um, you know, Sometimes I think, especially in our current culture, we often view vulnerability as weakness. And um, and so I think for companies and for employers in general, it can be it can be challenging to acknowledge what what's not working, right? Um, but what was amazing, I think, and and what maybe is a little bit unique in 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 our structure is this cohort model. And what we began to hear from our employers was having this safe space to have conversations with strangers. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes there's safety in being in a room full of strangers because you can begin to say, hey, this is what I'm really struggling with, or even this is what I'm personally struggling with. And that's different than when you're surrounded by coworkers or other teammates where you feel like, well, if you're in HR, you can't say anything. Sure, right? sure. Um, but but there's there's... I would say less ability to be transparent in some ways than when you're surrounded by this Absolutely. group of other sort of people who are facing similar challenges. Yeah. So that's an that's an intentional design decision that you made as you crafted this company. Is you could have had consultants go into each organization at a time and give them their mandates and tell them their expectations and here's how you get certified. And you totally flipped that on its head and said, no, it has to be interdisciplinary. And that and I think part of that was that this could 
open people up to having a safe, secure environment to be able to talk through difficult conversations. Absolutely. And even talk through some of their own personal challenges around inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And so... Um, you know, part of our in our learning sessions, we dive into a lot of things. We talk about change and change management. How do you sort of navigate that process as you begin to to roll these things out? But I think the other piece of it is doing an internal dive to say, where do where do I have bias? And even when I look, you know, a lot of times as um, DNI practitioners or as HR professionals. We know logically that we want to have diversity in our workplaces, but when we begin to look at our own inner circle and our own personal lives, in some instances, you may have the diversity that you want, and in some instances, you may not. And so part of it is sort of tying sort of our own personal experience to the outcomes that we see in the workplace, because workplaces are nothing more than buildings filled with individual people, right? right. And so everyone sort of brings those personal lenses. And so it's it's really interesting to have conversations when we start to dive into that. Um, and we start to see that intersectionality. And I think what's beautiful about the cohort, because people are there with good intentions, and we sort of start off these conversations with the understanding that we're going to to sort of walk into the uncomfortable, people are willing to say, hey, tell me more about, about what you meant by that, because here's how I heard it, and here's how it makes me feel. You know, there's this, it, it sort of opens up a dialogue uh, between people that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and we can get a little bit deeper into the intersection of, you know, the challenges that the LGBTQ community might face versus, um, you know, in particular women of color or women who might have a disability or even, uh, you know, men who who want to take a more active role in caregiving and sort of the, the barriers that they face. So um, I think that the space that it creates, that safe space that it creates is really important to the process, both for the individuals, but I think also in helping them frame um, sort of the, I would say, almost the pitch to the work when they go back into the organizations of explaining why is this important. Oh, absolutely. So do you notice that some of your cohort members will pull on each other's stories and then take those back to their own organizations to say, well, here's what I'm hearing collectively uh, across other members of my cohort. And and that it, it sort of increases the confidence in the story. Oh, absolutely. And that's what's been pretty amazing, even within the working group. So um, some of our working groups will say, hey, you know, some of our leadership is says, a year long is a long time. Why do we need a year? And she said, I was able to go back and say, because we're working on this in a large group and we have this framework and, um, you know, all of the different experiences, all the research from all these companies, we're going to have access to that data and to that information and to that input. And so in a sense, I think when organizations feel like they're part of a larger whole, um, it sort of allows space for that process to breathe in maybe ways that it wouldn't have otherwise. So I think a lot of times DNI practitioners or HR professionals are tasked with creating more diverse workplaces. And they're sort of tasked with these initiatives to create more inclusive workplaces. But they're not often given the time or resources to do it well. And so this is a way to say, hey, not only are we taking this approach, but all of these other organizations are taking this approach and we're going to learn together. And so I think that it's that power in numbers in a way. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to go back to to this idea of how can storytelling support recruitment, especially for companies or leaders who maybe aren't ready to commit to this. Have you, you know, as you go out into the world and explain what this certification is for and why it's going to make a difference, have you found certain storytelling tactics working better than others? Um, and have you found a way to sort of break through when a company's culture or its leadership maybe doesn't see the value. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the key things that I've learned around storytelling is that it's all about relationships and trust building. And when you meet with anyone to sort of tell the story of innovation or tell the story of the work that you're doing, I think the most important and the most influential thing that you can do is find a personal connection with that person to understand what are the unique challenge that the challenges that they're personally experiencing, right? Because I think in many ways, humans are um, sort of wired to avoid pain more than they are to seek pleasure. And we all struggle with these challenges in the workplace, particularly, I think, for the for the organizations and for the people that I meet with, they're responsible for a lot of employees, 
right? And they're responsible for those that employee experience. And so they have that pressure on them of of being the person who's sort of shaping the experience and the, the experiences of other people within the organizations. And so part of it, I think, is sitting down and finding, like, where are your pain points? What are you struggling with? Um, where are your goals? What what do you vision for your organization? When you think about creating an inclusive workplace, what does that look like for you? And in a sense, I think then you can start to discern, okay, here's where their biggest challenges are, and here's maybe we where we can help them with those challenges, and, and here's how we can sort of – um, customize their experience and make sure that they have uh, the information and the resources and the support and the networking they need to achieve those goals. So I think part of it is finding that connection, being able to share personal stories too. I think, you know, I always, when I meet with folks, tell them the personal story of how I got here. Because really, I think it's important, especially as an entrepreneur, you have to have the passion behind it. This is, for me, uh, yes. <laughs> this is non-negotiable, right? When I think of um, the experiences of my friends and my colleagues. I love that. Passion calling, is non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. Because, <laughs> I love it. Because when you come into a, to somebody, they're not just investing in the company or the process. They're investing in you. And I think if they know that this for you is what you're meant to do, and this is your passion, and this is why it's so important to you, they're more likely to come on that journey with you. Yeah. Right? I love that. So that speaks to not just the content of the story, but its delivery. Absolutely. Enthusiasm and passion um, and commitment can be 60% of what makes a story impactful. Yes. And I think the idea of partnership, that I'm not, you know, I think... Yeah. Um, to be quite honest, I'm not here to sell any organization on QCC. I'm here to find partners in this work. Mm -hmm. And I think the organizations who've come and have worked with us, the employers, in many ways, they're already committed to this work. They're bought in. They just might need the extra tools, the resources, the community to push it one step further. And so for me, I'm when I'm meeting with potential clients, I'm on the search for partners. And I think when you can communicate that, when you can communicate and say, hey, we're in this together, we're designing this together, we're going to study the outcomes together, um, we're going to sort of experience the pain points together, um, it creates sort of a shared journey that I think um, people long for, don't you think? I mean, oh, yeah. I think people want to feel like they're, they're sort of moving toward their goals. Yeah. Um, both in a deliberate way and with a roadmap, but with somebody who who is passionate is going to, to be on that journey with them in the long haul. Yeah. And that's, for me, that's non-negotiable because, like I said, I have a daughter. Um, but even for our sons, I think for all of our children, I don't want to be having this conversation in 20 years. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> Amen. Me either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I think one of the questions I, I sent to you sort of before the interview had to do with, how do you use empathy to try to uh, change the mindset of someone who might look at something like this and say, it's irrelevant to me. I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm in a position of leadership. I uh, Why should I be concerned, really, about bias? Um, I like to think most people wouldn't at least say that out loud, but perhaps <laughs> comfort or uh, other reasons might sort of cause complacency. So... Yeah, what what do you think? How do you address that uh, concern about maybe what if what if this innovation's not relevant to me? Is there a way that is there are there certain strategies that you think are effective ways to convert that person to become a believer? Yes and no. So I think that um, for the folks who who may have sort of an understanding of of some level of empathy. They have investment in their company. They're willing and open to have the conversations. Absolutely. Yes. You can you can find ways to relate uh, someone else's experiences to them. Um, sort of our approach is we won't convince the people who don't want to be convinced, right? And um, I think if we if we start to go and we start to outreach and we start to build conversations and relationships for the people who are invested and committed to this work, there's power in numbers. Yes, yes. And so instead of trying to convert those that we will probably never convert, we focus more on helping to leverage and make more visible those who are already doing the work. Yeah. Um, I would say some of the keys to building empathy, I think it's, again, it's relating it back to personal experience. And if you can relate it back, you know, I always tell people, I'm not going to make the business case for gender equity because it's already been made. But there is a, a human case, right? So when we are thinking about our workplaces, we all want the best talent. 
We all want the most innovative ideas. And if you're only looking at a small group of people for those ideas and for that innovation, you're going to be very limited, right? It's a very limited experience. So part of what we talk about is diversity in a sense, diversity of ideas, experiences, lived experiences, that doesn't cost you a lot. It just costs you time and commitment and intention. Yes, And the benefits of that far outweigh staying sort of in your comfort zone. So part of what we sort of challenge our our participants and our organizations to do is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yep. And um and so I think in a in a way it's tying it back to the the what's in it for me, what's the why, yeah. you know, what's the pain point. So if m- maybe you don't see why inclusion or diversity is important to you on a day-to-day basis, but if you can start to tie it to your work, Right. So when we start to look at the outcomes of of projects or of innovations or of new ideas, um, this everyone wants successful teams. So there's ways to tie it back to that. Um, I think Definitely. there's something to be said too for sort of the moral imperative. I, you know, we don't we don't necessarily depend on that, but I think a lot of our organizations, a lot of the leaders in the space who come to us, believe it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's a, a really great place to start as well. Yeah. Um, and I think just having facilitating those conversations, you know, it can be hard to understand somebody's experience if you've never been there. And I think one can imagine how somebody feels in a specific situation. But I think having a relationship with that person and building that trust and building that relationship, you have more empathy for somebody that you care about. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And so part of it is sort of of, of addressing um, sort of the relationship building and, and challenging people to sort of expand their networks. Yes, yeah. You know, I'm thinking you've addressed so beautifully how um, how co- commitments to inclusivity and challenging organizational structures can change a workplace. I'm thinking in particular, if we zoom out even farther to the systemic sort of structures around venture capital and mm-hmm. the innovation community um, and the fact that so much venture capital historically has gone to white male founders, um, young white male founders actually too. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of an ageism associated with it as well. And we're starting to see this change. We're starting, it's only I think the beginning of the change, but there seems to be more attention and there is more, uh, from a data perspective, more funding going to female founders. there's often a business case around that, that you're missing out on full markets. You're missing out on uh, divergent thinking. What are your What are your thoughts around, um, based on what you know about how inclusivity changes a workplace, what do you think we should expect to see in the future when it comes to innovation itself and the way it's funded? Well, you know, so one of the biggest group of small business owners are women. And so women are out there doing the work. And I think you're right, absolutely, that women are far less likely to get venture capital. I think less than 2% of venture capital goes to women-owned That's businesses. That's a painful stat, yes. <laughs> it's, it is painful. And I think um, particularly when we think of the intersection of, of race and gender, even less so to, to women of color. And I think part of it goes back to this idea that we um, view sort of the male experience or the white young male experience as universal. Right. And so when we look to the attributes that people bring to the marketplace, to the skills that they have, we look at it through that lens. And what we know, even in the workplace, is that we hire men for potential and we hire women for experience. So we even when you're think about people and coming out of college, right, you have maybe a male founder and a female founder. Well, if we're looking through the lens of experience versus potential, neither one of those students or young people are going to have a lot of experience. Right. But if we reward men for potential, we're more likely to invest in them than if we reward women for experience because they're just not likely to have it at that young age. So even that disparity in how we reward right. people from very entry level right out of college creates this divide that then follows people throughout a lifetime, particularly in their career. And I think long term, when we're thinking of systemic change, I think addressing some of these things in the workplace will lead to systemic change because when we when we look at the gender pay gap – Um, When we look at the raw gender pay gap, even the opportunity gap, how we actually reward professions, we know that we – it has little to do with the job itself. It really has more to do with the people that fill them. And I I always use this example of um, technology. You know, back in the 60s, coding was a woman's job. 
Um, women were called computers, right? They were literally human computers, and it wasn't rewarded mm-hmm. um, financially that well. Yeah. Well, what happened is more and more men entered that field. The salaries went up. Mm. And the same is true. When more women enter a male-dominated field, the salaries drop. So part of part of when we're looking at systems and we're looking at how we reward attributes and what we bring to the marketplace is understanding that it's not that we're rewarding the job itself. It's that we literally reward jobs differently based on who is the majority dominant group that fills those roles. And so part of, I think, trying to close the gap within the workplace um, comes back in some ways to economic justice. Right. Yes, it's yeah, rewarding absolutely. women and people of color and other underrepresented groups for the attributes they bring to the marketplace in ways that are fair and equitable yes. so that they have uh, more influence over decision making and their voices are heard and they're invited not only to the table, but they influence the direction that organizations take. So, you know, I think I think going back to your point of systems, that's how I sort of view systems change is first we have to redesign the system. We have to be compensating people equitably yeah, because with that compensation and with that economic justice comes power in many ways. Absolutely. You know, let's, let's wrap up with a sort of rapid fire. What stories do you and I want to hear more of when it comes to equity in the workplace, in the innovation community, uh, more broadly? You want to just r- rapid fire? I want to hear more stories of uh, female founders and the reasons why they got funding, I want to hear those stories center around uh, potential. After hearing you mention those disparities, I actually I didn't know that. So I want to hear more stories about um, how a VC or a funder saw potential in a female founder, why, and um, and I just want to hear those amplified more. That's one for me. What about yes, you? And I would take it one step further. I want to hear more stories about women of color. And yes. the successes that they've had. Yes. And I want to start viewing success in different ways. I'm thinking of like backstage capital. Yes. I love following their work. I, want, I don't over... want to hear about any more white Harvard dropouts that founded tech companies. <laughs> no I'm more garage know, gurus. We're right. done. I don't, I don't want those stories. <laughs> I want the stories of women who built their businesses from nothing because that's what so many women are forced to do. And Raise I want your to hand hear... if that's you. Yeah. Both of our hands are up. <laughs> yes. You know we can't see. <laughs> I want to hear the stories of mothers and fathers. I want actually, you know what I really want to hear more of? I want to hear more stories about men and boys who are overcoming the gender norms and the gender stereotypes that limit their potential. I think so oftentimes we focus gender equity on just women. And those norms, those those rigid gender norms that we have are equally harmful to men and boys. And I want to hear those stories. Yeah. I want to amplify those stories to make it acceptable that men can be in caretaking roles and and diff, uh, professions that maybe we think of for women. I always joke, we don't need more women in STEM. I mean, it's great if we have them in STEM, but we need more men in early childhood education and <laughs> sure, nursing, yeah, right? Yeah, so right, right. I want to hear those stories. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Um, thank you. I We could go on and on. Uh, we could talk all afternoon, but I'm so grateful to have had this, this short bit of time with you to explore these topics. And I can't wait to hear um, what all of the listeners think. Uh, please share your thoughts uh, you know, in comments. And let's continue this conversation around why diversity and inclusion matter to innovation and how we can start amplifying those stories so much more. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 